Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Laura Haywood. Today we're talking about The Song of Sway Lake, a new film by award-winning director Ari Gold, starring celebrated stage and screen actress Mary Beth Peel. Ari and Mary Beth are both here, and I'm so eager to dig into this beautiful project with them, a mysterious and timeless piece about family, music, legacy, love, and nostalgia. Let's take a look at the trailer for The Song of Sway Lake. Dearest Charlotte, you beg me to freeze time. Dearest Hal, our son said that when words fail, there's music. Every young couple knows the number one hit, Sway Lake. But did you know that Sway Lake is a real place? Start in the east attic, and then work our way through until we find this record. Your papa never left you a will. Uh, if he did, my grandmother burned it. I'm Mrs. Sway. This is my house. Who are you? He's from Russia. The greatest nation on earth. Why does she not go to the dock? If she weren't rich, she'd just be crazy. That bird is just like me. Lonely too. I'm, I'm Ollie. Is the door out? Sorry about your dad. How'd you know about my dad? Cool. Your father cursed this place when he did what he did. He was an unhappy soul. Excuse me. Holy. The perfect record. I never wanted you to become like Timmy, attached to all these dead things. Dad, I miss you. Why'd you do it? It's easier to lose a father than a son. You're supposed to be helping me. I will fix everything. I gave you a home. I didn't give you my name. We don't have to be perfect. You are a keeper of secrets, Charlie. Congratulations, Ari, and congratulations, Mary Beth. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here to talk about The Song of Sway Lake, which I had a chance to see an advanced screening of, but is going to be in theaters for everyone to see in just a few days. Yeah, we're, we're in 10 CDs, and anyone else can get it on VOD. So if you go to swaylake.com, all the information is there. You can even pre-order the VOD, which you is great. You can. Yeah. I hope people do. Yeah, I, they will, yeah. especially after seeing that trailer. It's gorgeous. There's so much, so much nostalgia about this film, um, and it's it's about it takes place now, but it's got this timeless feeling. Uh, and you grew up in going to the Adirondacks and experiencing that kind of feeling of nostalgia, right? Yeah, the Adirondacks is a really special part of the country that uh, New Yorkers may know and other people may not know. Which is, I think, it's the largest park possibly in the country, the largest, mm. it's not a national park, but I don't remember the designation, but it's got this rich history because back what before jet travel, all the most glamorous people of New York would have these huge houses up there that they called camps, but they were really like little palaces. And um, growing up and going there in the summer, you had this sense that the glamour had kind of diminished, but the beauty had not diminished. Mm -hmm. And so the longing for a time when people might have had elegant gowns and had these elegant parties uh, kind of infected my thoughts about the place. So it's not just beautiful nature, but it's this, this culture. Um, and so the film, one of the things it's about is the history of, of um, you know, the glamorous greatest generation in America, which her character, Charlie Sway, represents. It actually does, it, it is a double period piece because it takes place in the 90s because otherwise yeah, that's she right. would have to be way, <laughs> you'd have to be... Um, 110. Yeah, but uh, she, she, her character comes of age uh, in World War II and like a lot of people in that generation, who the ones who came back from the war, there was a kind of a grace about them but also a pride that the generations that came after couldn't live up to. Mm -hmm. And that sense of not getting, being able to live up to that heroic generation is one of the major themes of the movie. Will you tell us a little bit about Charlie and the way you understand her? I think I'm, I'm still 
I will never tire of trying, trying to or enjoying understanding Charlie. And, and Ari described it perfectly. That generation after World War II, during World War II, and after that we're trying to adjust to the realities of how life changed drastically, as it does after any major war, World War I, World War II. Um, that sort of longing for the past, the past glory, the past love of her life, and yet having to live in, in a very real world, which is fine. She's not down and out by any means, but she's very closed off. Um, so closed off that she's not able to grieve mm -hmm. for her husband, the love of her life who died, um, not able to grieve for her son who has committed suicide on the very lake where the, the family compound is. The lake that's named for their family. The lake that's no named less. for the family, Sway Lake, because they were the first ones to inhabit it and claim it. Beautiful, pristine, to this day, Blue Mountain Lake up in the Adirondacks, if you ever get a chance to go visit. It is so beautiful. It's still, you can see your hand in the water. You can drink the water, I think. Wow. It's still pristine. Um, but she's not able to deal with the realities of that lost time and the, the loss of the love of her life and arguably her son, who was not the love of her life. Mm -hmm. I think it was one of those families where the love match between mom and pop was so strong that the son was left out a great deal. And he took solace in music. Yes. I know that music is very important to you and has been a key part of basically all of the projects you've done. Have you ever made a film that wasn't kind of centered around well, music? some of my short films were not music. Yeah, like I guess in, culture has isn't, yeah, doesn't well, have a music theme. I'm very impressed with your research. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, culture is a one-minute film that that consists of me having an air air war with myself um, with an air gun, uh, which makes no sense. It's very powerful. Yeah. Not Thank the you. air gun, but the the piece. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, music is is crucial to my life. Uh, crucial to the way I tell stories, the way I think about stories. Um, and for this movie, you know, music is, music and smell, I think, are the fastest way to jack into a kind of nostalgia. Mm, trigger um, memory. And you can't smell a movie, but I wanted people to feel that they could smell the lake. And so music, and my, my twin brother, Ethan Gold, wrote this beautiful score and the song of Sway Lake itself, which we created to sound like it came from 1940. And then we mixed that with songs from the 1930s and 40s that Rory Culkin's character uh, plays on the record player and he's you know he's the two generations after uh, Mary Beth's character he his father has committed suicide on the lake and he can either go down the path of his father of being obsessed with old music and not knowing how to live or he can shed that and and his his story is one of trying to grapple with you know, how, how do you come out under the shadow of a family that's so glamorous that you can't live up to it? Um, and he starts with music as a crutch, and he, he progresses to uh, something, which I don't... I, yeah, I we don't I want to... No, no spoilers. Yes. I do, I do want to say, um, you know, a, a theme in this film that we saw in the trailer is about owning uh, a music, you know, and it's like the, there's this old record that he goes out to... to claim um, and the search for this piece is you know central to the storyline music as something you can own as opposed to something that belongs to everyone is such a fascinating topic mm -hmm. to me I do have one bone to pick with you though and that is you made a film in which music is totally central and you had at your disposal one of the great voices of the American <laughs> stage, and Mary Beth doesn't sing at all. I sang a lot on set. Did you? But we didn't get, like, not in the film. How could we, you we did talk misuse about that, once. that resource? Yeah. We, we did talk about that once. I mean, can we find a way yeah. to... But, you know, her character You know, I'm obviously an, being tongue-in-cheek about... No, I know. Yeah, but, it, but my character, just as she can't grieve, she definitely could not sing. Mm -hmm. She was very... Yeah. Bot, a very locked, locked. Mm -hmm. But her, yeah. her, her theatrical and operatic training was really one of the reasons I was attracted to, to her uh, playing the role because she needs to 
carry so much when she first walks in that everyone's intimidated by her. Her grandson's terrified of her. Her grandson's best friend, played by Robbie Sheehan, is is transfixed by her. And all of that had to be in a walk. And I th theater trained actors and opera trained, you know, that you, you can't, it's, you don't wait for the close up to, uh, to seduce an audience. It sounds uh, like the characteristics of a dowager empress. I was gonna say, it's all those costumes. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> long no, dresses. It's the spine and the spirit. Um, but we do have a record and I forgot to bring it, but I, I wanted to show off that we have a, we, we're vinyl, it's a vinyl obsessed movie. Uh -huh. um, but I forgot it in the green room. But I was gonna, sh I was gonna show everyone the beautiful vinyl. We oh well, maybe we can have somebody bring it, bring it out yeah. for that. But yeah, I mean, music uh, vinyl collectors will dig this movie too because it's, uh, it's about an obsession with vinyl. Although it's actually seventy-eight speed, which would have been shellac. They didn't use vinyl, <laughs> I think, until nineteen forty-six. Someone will, someone will correct me on that. But, um, but yeah, this idea that music could be owned. I mean, especially now, it's it's so ludicrous. But um, that's one of the things that's kind of magical is they're looking for a song nobody's heard and it, there's only one physical copy of it. Mm -hmm. And so whoever finds it has the opportunity to hear it, but by tearing open the, the sleeve, they ruin its financial value. So there's a, there's a paradox there. It's sort of a Schrodinger's cat of music. Like, yeah. does yeah. it exist if yeah. nobody yeah. can ever listen if to it? Can't hear it. Um, yeah. So, uh, Mary Beth, you and I got to know each other because you're starring on Broadway in Anastasia. Yes, and it was impossible for me not to watch this and create or come up with parallels between these two regal, glorious Actually. women and their relationships with their estranged grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And even in both cases, there's a physical object that links them together. Mm -hmm. um, did you think about that at all? Was this when was the, what was the timing of your filming of this related to Long the journey ago. with Anastasia? Long before. <laughs> oh, yeah? So Anastasia yeah. was not um, in your no. like, physical I, I've consciousness? I've always had a wonderful, uh, at least I considered a wonderful obsession, fixation with Russian music, art, history, and the Romanovs, of course, figure prominently in that. Um, so when the role, that role came along, I just glommed onto it. But I didn't think of it... Um, I think even I'm, it's hard to say if I would have thought of it if we were shooting Charlie now, but definitely the, the inability to grieve in the, as far as a dowager empress because she's trying to believe that her granddaughter is still alive. Mm -hmm. And um, so she's holding on to that. So she, she's stuck in a kind of PTSD, as Charlie is too, in a way, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I just wanna take the opportunity to say you still have a couple of weeks or like a One few week. performances left to go and see Mary Beth on stage in Anastasia, so um, go see it. Did you, have, did you go see, have you seen her on of course. stage? Yeah, yes. isn't it a remarkable um, performance? Um, it's, it's so powerful, you're so Thank powerful you. on stage. Uh, when did how did the casting process work? How did you you talked a little bit about the characteristics that attracted you to Mary Beth, but what was the process like? Well, you know, and she didn't audition for us. We just we, we had just, lunch. We 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 took lunch. Yes, uh -huh. I had to impress her. I think I think you thought I was crazy, right? I did, and you still do. Well, I yes. was going to say, were you wrong? <laughs> I mean, he's an artist. <laughs> what was it about him that made you want to say yes, even though you the script? Mm. I thought anybody that can write this script, and then we have friends in common um, who spoke highly of Ari as a director as well, so. Did he teach you any air drumming on the set? That got passed by me. <laughs> do you, do, have There's you seen his time. previous work? I'm gonna go out and watch it soon after. Right yeah, Ari, you, this is a very, this is a real departure from people who know you as power. Well, you know, the, the spirit of the air drumming movie, Adventures of Power in this, are, are, are not that, far from each other. They're both music-based. They're mm -hmm. both about coming into yourself. Mm -hmm. um, they're both about becoming present, which as a meditator is something that I work <laughs> at <laughs> daily. What kind of meditation uh, do you practice? Uh, currently, I'm doing a, a form of Kriya Yoga meditation, which mm -hmm. anyway, this, this is the kind of thing that people are like, what are they talking I about? I know, but I also but think yeah. that like meditation is such an important, I feel like it's like the way exercise was in the 60s where people were like, what do you mean you just run? Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. And now people are like, what do you mean you just sit there? But yeah. I think well, it's, it's, hard. it's coming into its own. And the first shot of this movie came to me in a meditation. I'm not sure I told you this, but no. I, I, I gave you a watch. Yes. And the reason I gave, I gave her a watch when we finished the movie um, 
there's a watch that plays into the movie. There's a the the Russian character, Russian again, the mm-hmm. Russian the Russian young man who who falls in love with her, um, wants to steal this wa- this military watch from the forties from the house, um, and during a three day meditation when I was trying to finish the movie and grappling with the the struggle of independent film and getting a movie out and I went into this silent meditation um, not expecting to think about the movie but as anyone who meditates know it, it, you're not sitting there in peace nope. it's like you know <laughs> trying to get the voices to shut in up. your brain <laughs> yeah. but second day I'm losing my mind and you know almost like trembling because you know and you know even I'm not a very well trained meditator but two days of silence is a lot for me um, and suddenly this image of a watch sinking in black water just shot into my head like an arrow um, and then I came out of the meditation and I was like what was that mm-hmm. and I r- realized it was a metaphor for letting go of time and then I th- realized that was the opening shot of my movie you better keep meditating yeah. <laughs> 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 but th- you know there's this watch in the movie and I had never I hadn't shot the shot of it sinking in the water but there's a reason which you see if you see the movie there's a reason why it's in the water and I hadn't filmed it. And I thought, that's the missing shot. So, it, anyway, I shot it with my iPhone actually underwater. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wait, how do you uh, shoot with an iPhone underwater? You put a wrap on it and stick it in a few inches and kind of hold it <laughs> and dangle that's a watch. That's crazy. That's just crazy. No, but it's, 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 it's gorgeous and it looks like it's sinking in the lake, but it, it does. I couldn't go back to the lake. But, yeah. but um, that became, for me, the, the key image to frame the whole movie because uh, her character is trying to return to her own past, mm-hmm. which is gone. The Russian who uh, idealizes her is trying to kind of go to her past, mm-hmm. so he can't get that either. And the Rory Culkin character is trying to erase the past, which is also impossible. Um, so all three of these main characters are in this really unhealthy relationship with time and the movie is about them becoming into the present. And so that image was, was a gift of the meditation because it, that's what it's all about. And that's also, you know, and I was like, oh, the, I struggle with that. That's why, that's why I made this movie. Yeah. <laughs> and in- I didn't know that when I started. It's interesting, too. I, I did an interview the other day, and, and um, this question came up. Uh, he had seen the movie, and he said, do you think that you could capsulize the relationship between these three people that Charlie, my character, is just yearning to go backwards, to to relive the days with her husband and the days of glory. And, but she's a older person, Mm -hmm. wants to go back. The young people are dying to grow up. Mm. They just can't wait to grow up. And the Russian fellow wants to re capture what it's like to be that generation that Charlie is and the the grandson wants to grow up and be a man. Mm-hmm. It's kind of fun that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of that in life. It's the line that the line that sticks out from the film the most to me is one of the um, peripheral characters or one of the supporting characters, I guess, and she says it's like this place that I I feel like I miss it even though I'm still here. And I feel like Mm. that's such a, like, that's, I feel Mm -hmm. like I have moments like that, like, where I'll be like, oh, man, I'm going to be, you get caught up in the anticipation of the nostalgia Uh and lose the opportunity to just be in the moment. And this is such a, like, I've never seen a movie like this before that really feels like it's about celebrating the, the breath that you need to take to really live the moment. I think it's very she Bergman-esque. Movie. I know she did. <laughs> I think Good, it, I'm glad. It's very Bergman-esque in that way. I think that's the way I would describe a lot of his movies, too. There's this weird thing with time and nature where it gets all mushed together in a beautiful way. I was watching a, a lot of Bergman and Romer mm. with my co-writer, Elizabeth Bull, when we were conceiving this, and you know, we're, we're not... I'm not Bergman, and I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm. I am who I am. But, uh, but yeah, I wanted to. I, I certainly admire movies that um, 
play with time that way. And, and each, of, each of the characters has their own kind of dream life that we see as well. It's like, mm -hmm. I thought suddenly of um, 9 to 5, the Lily Tomlin movie mm -hmm. from the 70s, where they, they all have their fantasy sequences. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you may remember that. But so every character has their, has their sees different ghosts in the house and sees different dreams of the past. Um, so and and even the supporting characters, as you said, you know that's a uh, uh, Isadora Isabel McNally's uh, character, the purple-haired girl, and I mm -hmm. like that you're wearing purple. Yeah, it actually is exactly uh, that yeah. shade. Um, she's which I call she's Anastasia trying purple. To <laughs> get, purple. She's trying to get into into the past as well, and she changed. She's sort of I, I don't want. Yeah, I'm not, spoiler I'm not, alert. Nothing. <laughs> um, and uh, Elizabeth Pena's character is um, her her time has been frozen when she was separated from her family, probably at the age of twenty in the in the backstory of the movie. So there's, you know, you have all these characters who are 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 trying to wake up, like we all are, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a it, so I don't have the the intricate knowledge of those old movies um, like the Bergman. I, do, I just haven't I haven't seen those, but some films that I love came to mind and I'm curious as to what your take on this is Terminator 2 um, right? yeah I was like it's just I, I was a Robocop yeah. no just kidding <laughs> um no the, I thought about Dirty Dancing really mm -hmm. I think it was I the know what? I have never the... seen Dirty Dancing I'm what yeah. stop the, the interview I know, I know it's um, terrible but somehow I well mean, I, I love think dancing, it was filmed in the Adirondack the setting the I setting think, yeah it was yeah. it takes place at a camp I in the think, summer in the Adirondack yeah um and there's you know there's kind of kids getting up to mischief and their relationships Absolutely. with their parents yeah and I also thought about the great Gatsby did you think about oh, Dawson's yeah. Creek uh, actually, yeah, no, it's, I, I actually, I, yeah, you no. are really strange. Um, just it was more lake than creek. <laughs> yes, um, okay. But well, yeah, know, there's teen. this element of these these um, sort of beautiful young people going off to a mansion and mm -hmm. and play acting at yeah at elegant at being grown ups. And so I, yeah. if I was going to describe this in my, like with my movie lexicon, it would be um, Dirty Dancing and meets, meets the, the Great Gatsby. Gatsby. I love that. I, I dig it. Yeah. I so go it. watch that movie and then yeah. get back yeah. to me and okay. let me know whether you agree. <laughs> um, I saw. I see that through the magic of, of television, we got that. Um, yes, I'm gonna. We got the vinyl out here. Tell us about it. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, it's a 45. It's a 45. I gotta get my mic back. Yeah. Oh yes. Um, yeah. Um, my t twin brother, Ethan Gold. Um, also your bandmate. Sometimes, Somet sorry, yeah, sometimes not, when we're not punching each other like the Gallagher <laughs> brothers, uh, which happened a lot during <laughs> making this movie. But no, my brother is is a brilliant uh, composer and singer songwriter, and he proposed after we shot that the the world of Sway Lake would be elevated if the song they were looking for was about Sway Lake mm -hmm. and was truly composed for Sway Lake. We, when we were shooting, we were using a, a real old song from the 40s, um, oh. which I ended up moving to the beginning of the movie uh, to sort of introduce the movie. But so my brother composed the song of Sway Lake itself, um, and we had a brilliant arranger here in New York and musicians uh, actually from around the world. We got uh, John Grant, this uh, brilliant singer, has a new record coming out uh, in a few weeks, and the Staves. Uh, an English sister trio to sing in these styles. John Grant does a kind of Hutch style, if anyone knows 40s music. Everyone knows who Hutch is, right? <laughs> uh, a few people know who the Andrews sisters are, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so the Staves do an Andrews sisters style. <laughs> no, I do too. I don't anyway, know Hutch, but I know the Andrews sisters. We, we created uh, a song that uh, carries the the energy of, of this history, and uh, it's so convincing that at the first screening, the first question, and I was my, my brother said I, we can make it, we can convince people, and I said, but people aren't going to believe it's a real song from the forties. The very first question at the very first screening was an older person in the front row said, "I'm a fan of old this old music. Where did you find that song?" Yeah, and we said, yeah. "Find it. Yeah. We made it." And so yeah. we were really shocked and amazed that people had kind of not fallen for it, but had it believed that we that this song was real. It's incredibly and that this place was real. Yeah. I get people saying, well, how do I, where is Sway Lake? Mm -hmm. And they Google it, and it's... It, and they find the know. movie, and, and they, they the order movie. the yeah. VOD on demand. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but so my brother composed melodies for the score 
throughout the movie so that when the song starts to reveal itself, you feel like you've heard it before. So the nostalgia is yeah. already yeah, exactly. even like, it is it. like a like the yeah. whiff of an old perfume that yeah. triggers the memory. Let's give the audience an opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Hi. Um, so you were kind of mentioning how you were working with your twin brother on this uh, on this project, and how he was the composer. I'm just wondering, like, what is that process like of actually working with your brother, like, so closely, either on this project or previous ones? Like, does it work? Is it more difficult? Do you find it easier than other times? Tell the punching stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, Answer however you like. You know, my brother actually, I mean, the punching story, we, we never punch each other. I don't, <laughs> I have to think about that, actually. I don't think we, there's some shoving. Um, but no, this one he actually, not through some kind of telepathic attempt on my part, but he had a traumatic brain injury uh, unrelated while we were doing this, which delayed the completion of the movie by a lot because he, he couldn't speak or he couldn't speak for a while, which was terrifying. Um, but uh, yeah, working with, a, with a, a brother, any family member, but I think brothers have a very specific kind of energy. Um, I think of myself as a musician, and he thinks of himself as a filmmaker, and so I get in his business all the time, and he gets in my business all the time. Um, and the end result, I think, is that we elevate each other. The but perfect person. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's, it's combat, because we, we have different ideas about what works. But he was really helpful in terms of pushing me to understand the theme of the movie, um, and I hope I was helpful with him in pushing him musically. Um, so we push, we push each other. How is he doing now? Oh, every, he's great. He's great. That that injury, he did a lot of uh, work to kind of get back on, back on track, and he's totally fine. In fact, he's, I think his soulfulness, he connected in a way. Not being able to speak, it relates to what we were talking about here about the movie. Not being able to speak, um, you connect with where you are because that's all you have. And so you think about people who, you know, might be on their deathbed and they can't talk. They might be at the most present moment in their lives. And it's worth remembering that if you're ever um, in hospice or, you know, with a family member who's dying, even if they can't talk, the, the, it could really be the moment of their life that, that they've been hiding from. Mm. And it's impossible not to bring that back around to what you were saying about your silent meditation. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's true. You weren't yeah. speaking, and the, the, the core image of the movie came to you then. That's true, yeah. I mean, her character carries a lot of that because she hides behind her kind of jabby wit. Um, and at, again, I don't want to give spoilers, but the, the, her story is one where she goes from this ability to kind of cut people and, and say, say almost like funny things but that are, can be kind of cruel. Hurtful to um, being in sway, you know, that's where the word sway plays thematically is that she's, she's going from ice to water. She's becoming um, the human being that she probably was at the age of three mm. Mm. again. Yeah, so she, she does get what she, she wanted to go back. She finally breaks the breaks the prison. And it happens through mourning. It happens also through, you want to talk a little bit about working with Robert Sheehan? Um, <laughs> he plays the, the best friend of the, yeah, he, like he, the Russian best Russian. friend of the grandson. Yes, he's a beautiful, beautiful Irish actor um, who is fixated by my character. And um, without my realizing it, I uh, become fixated with him as well. And um, we do this little dance uh, that ends up in a beautiful, beautiful nostalgic romantic scene that helps Charlie move on mm. with her life. So the, the young Russian fellow who seemed like a jerk to her at the beginning turns out to be help her move on and um, she helps him move on. Mm. It's, really, it's a lovely kind of off-kilter love story between them. I would send uh, the two of them upstairs in, the, in, the, in this grand camp, we'd send them to, to the bedrooms upstairs to kind of run lines but get to know each other a little bit and it was nice to, f we saved the kind of most 
romantic moments between them until the end of the shoot or as close to the end of the shoot as we could so that they could develop secrets with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was quite beautiful on set when when they connect. And, you know, there's there is a thing sometimes when people are like, oh, it's Harold and Maude. You know, <laughs> they just jump to that. But it's this is a quite different yeah. thing because it's... Um, there's an elegant. It's actually romantic in the in the traditional sense of the word romance. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's almost like a a knight um, slaying dragons for the queen. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that level of romance between them, um, at least in their heads. I think the he Rory Culkin character yeah. doesn't buy it at no. all. No, <laughs> but, but I think that the, yeah. that his character just like in his deepest heart wishes that he was a war a, an American war hero. Absolutely, and he takes on that persona. He, uh, and being in this timeless location allows him he to can. pretend he's yeah. that yeah. that man. And then she sees that character he's invented and recognizes her late husband, who actually was the American war yeah. hero. Yeah. Um, it's really beautiful. Interestingly, um, I'm going to do, um, in two weeks, I'm starting a workshop of a musical adaptation of Harold and Maude. <gasps> really? You are? Yes, I am. And Breaking I'm not playing news, Harold either. You guys. <laughs> that's amazing. She's the right Which person one will for you it. be playing? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's awesome. I know. Is that I'm, here in New York? Yeah. Yeah. The workshop is in New York. Well, who knows what will happen with it? But hopefully, you'll be able to buy tickets in 10 years or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's I've really had exciting. so many women at screenings come up and say to, you know, women of a certain age. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> yes, dear. Uh, who will just say, thank you for showing how sexy we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. yeah. I say, thank yeah. Mary Beth. Yeah. No. We have time for one more audience question. Hi. Um, this question's for Ari. I am also studying to be a filmmaker, and I really love how you turned your childhood uh, like vacation destination into a movie, and how much that place means to you. And so I was wondering how you approached making this film with that in mind, if you felt any sort of responsibility to the place um, and how it differed from making a film in a location that wasn't as special to you. Mm -hmm. um, well, when you do, f when I do fiction, it's fed very much by uh, my real life and there's a strange thing that happens when you start converting a place or characters into fiction because, you know, there are elements of my grandmother in your character, as we talked about. Um, but uh, at a certain point, it takes on a life of its own, and you have to let fiction happen. And it's liberating when that happens. And then the, the memories become a source material that you can draw from. Mm -hmm. But if you feel obliged to tell the real thing, then you can trap yourself. Mm -hmm. Even when I've done a, I've done a more you know, tr truly autobiographical short films before, and you have to change a lot um, in order to communicate in a, in a storytelling context. You know, the great storytellers um, make things up. So uh, if you're basing something on your own, you know, family and your some place that's important to you. It's an incredible resource, but it can be a burden and it can be a distraction. So renaming the lake, Sway Lake, you know, coming up with this idea that it was a private lake, which this lake never was. Um, you know, we made, we did a lot to kind of turn her legacy into one that was royal in a way that, you know, my grandmother wasn't royalty, was not, she wasn't, she didn't own a private lake that, you know, um, but, the personality was a great kind of engine for the whole thing. So, you know, it's a line you have to walk. And I also worked with a co-writer who, you know, didn't have that experience. So we, we could talk things through and and make sure I wasn't getting stuck. And, you know, I remember at a certain point saying, oh, there should be more cousins, because I had cousins. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, wait, we want to keep the characters to a minimum. And so having the co-writer remind me, like, let's get rid of all that other stuff was useful. Um, you get stuck in your own head if you're writing by yourself, as you may know. <laughs> I hate that we're out of time because this this film is so beautiful and layered and the idea of the song as being both uh, like a literal thing and as being a way to describe the film as this 
this love letter to a time and place that may never have existed except in people's imaginations. I could talk to you for hours about it, and it really has been an honor to talk to both of you about the process and about this incredible finished product. Ari Gold and Mary Beth Peel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you thank so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming.